Last month, we did an entire series on organic gardening basics. And I promised you that if you asked questions, I would set aside a special episode just to answer them. Well, I've compiled all of the most popular questions and I'm here with the answers. Hey guys, I'm Brian with Next Level Gardening, and if you're looking to join an online garden community that offers tips, tricks, and support to help take your garden to the next level, you're in the right place. Get started now by clicking subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss anything. Now let's get growing. In addition to the questions and answers, after that, I am going to be announcing the three winners of our BlackBerry giveaway. No, I haven't forgotten. And before we get started, I have a quick announcement about our next series. Um, and there's a little bit of a change. I had planned on having the March series be edible landscaping and then doing a series on companion planting in April. Well, when I started putting things together, I realized they kind of go hand in hand. And you might need to know some of these companion planting strategies before April. So, I'm going to put the two together because they really do go together. And we'll just see how long that series takes us every Saturday until we've exhausted it. And you guys know everything that I do. And I've been doing a ton of research and it's actually really exciting. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so let's get into the questions. The first question is from Charlie. My tomatoes are about four weeks old. I put them outside last week for a couple hours and did great. Can I still do that even now? I don't have too much time to actually harden these plants off except the weekend. I can't chance them out all day while I'm at work. If I start a little after work and during the weekend, will that be okay or would it set them back because I'll be bringing them back into the grow lights constantly? Um, I've brought a method up before. If you have three consecutive days of overcast weather, you can leave them out all day. So while you're at work, that would work fine. If you don't, you could leave them out all day in the shade, or if you have a spot that only gets a couple of hours of sun during the day, you could leave them in that spot and then it would be shaded the rest of the time you're at work. So maybe that's a Thursday, Friday deal. And then if you're home on Saturday, Sunday, you could slowly then move them maybe three hours into the sun on Saturday, four hours on Sunday, and they'd probably be good to go after that. And then if you want to, you could maybe put them in a spot where you can make a barrier where you know once the sun gets past this point, it's probably going to be there a certain amount of hours, and then that barrier will shade them for the rest of the day. It's okay if they're out in the shade all day while you're at work. You just have to control the hours of sunlight. And grow lights aren't going to set them back to bring them back in, you know, for the rest of the day. What we're really trying to do is, is thicken the uh, sunblock on the leaves. They, they actually do get thicker, and you can only do that with natural sunlight. Okay, the next question is from Mike McDonald. I've been trying to not turn my raised bed and just top dressing with compost. Some of my beds that are close to trees are getting small roots. Any ideas? Well, it's only gonna get worse. So if I were you, I don't know how much work you want to do, but if I were you before it starts to get worse, I would probably empty the beds out and put a couple layers of weed cloth as a barrier between the actual native soil. I'm guessing there's no bottom on the beds. Um, and then put the raised bed mix back in. I know that's a lot of work, but it's only going to get worse as time goes on, so it's best to, you know, head it off at the pass at this point. All right, Carolyn Steele asks, I want to plant tomatoes and onions in a new patch of ground that has compacted soil. If my soil test revealed a pH 7 and an NPK tested adequate to surplus, does that mean add peat or leaf mold and no fertilizer? Uh, so yeah, for this season, you would want to add organic matter for to build the soil if it's compacted. Organic matter in and of itself, compost and, and peat especially, uh, doesn't add a lot of NPK to the soil. It does help build the soil, so it's a great thing. You, you mu it's actually a must. But this, if you've had a test and the NPK is 
you know, at surplus and you are adding these things to build the soil, then you may not have to add fertilizer this season. But your potatoes and your onions are going to start sucking that nutrients up. So you, you know, it's not going to stay that way forever. You will have to add fertilizer, you know, maybe in the fall or next spring. Crystal asks, what about making a pest spray from cayenne, pepper, red onion water, etc.? Or what do you think about banana water for fertilizer? Uh, I know there's a lot of things going around about banana water and, and how you can use it on your plants. I don't think there's a lot of data to back that up. At least I haven't seen any. If you have, please send it my way. I, I want to see it. So I wouldn't waste my time with that if I were you. Uh, I know the cayenne spray works for squirrels and deer, and it probably works for some pests. Um, I haven't used a ton of it. In fact, the one time I made it homemade, I actually ended up burning my plants because I made it too strong. So if you found a, a recipe that you've used before um, or know somebody that has, you can use that. Uh, Neptune's Harvest actually has a cayenne spray that's already pre-done and you just mix it with the right amount of water. Um, I can put a link on my website and down below for that if you want to check it out. And the channel discount applies to that product as well. All right, the next question is from Stefan Allen. Hello, first of all, I want to thank you very much for all your great information. You're welcome. It's some of the best information I have found out there and have learned a lot. Awesome. I have two questions I'm hoping you can answer for me. For the neem oil, how often do you spray and do you spray after the pepper plants start producing fruit? And when do you start spraying? Uh, well, let me answer, ask that, answer that question first. I'm not a fan of just indiscriminately spraying everything, even with organic pesticides, uh, as a preventative measure. I would much rather visit my garden every day and when I see something happening, spot treat that specific area or that specific plant. Neem oil and other organic pesticides still can hurt some beneficial insects. Maybe some we don't even see. And you can use neem oil on any age plant. Second question was for the aspirin, how much or what is the ratio between aspirin and what and when do you start spraying and do you continue to spray after the plant starts producing fruit? So the aspirin, you know, it's around 600 milligrams per gallon. I believe that's what, it, what I use. Um, aspirin is the opposite though of the neem oil. Aspirin is a preventative. It's not going to cure something once you have it. Aspirin is for funguses, diseases, um, blight, things like that. So you start spraying almost as soon as you set the plants out, especially in uh, wet weather. If you have humid weather, rain a lot, that's where you're gonna get the fungal diseases more. And so every two weeks, you should be spraying the aspirin solution on your plants. And that will work for any of the nightshades. So tomatoes, peppers, um, eggplant, potatoes. Next one is from the Daydreamer. Nice videos, I like your work. Thank you. When we talk about soil, compost, and manure, if we obtain these products from our local nursery, how can we be certain that they are safe to grow food in? Is there a way we can test to be sure they're getting quality in their loads that they can provide to their customers? I'm not talking about OMRI listed bags of these products, but large piles that they have for sale. I need to be sure that what I'm growing in is safe. Thank you for all your videos. Okay, um, if you trust your nursery, ask them. If they are getting their supply from an organic farm, then they should be able to provide you with that information, proof, basically. Uh, you can also look up a soil testing lab in your local area. Just Google it and you can send your soil in or take it in if it's really local and they will test it. it usually takes a couple of weeks to get the results back to you a lot of times what they're looking for mainly is arsenic and lead and so you know they'll be able to have they'll be able to tell you if you um if they found that if you get mushroom compost typically that's going to be safe to use especially if it's from an organic farm they do sterilize and do a lot to that mushroom compost to have it 
you know, be sufficient for the mushrooms they're growing in. So typically that's going to be a good choice. Okay, Jamie asks, in regards to crop rotation, do you move your tomato trellis every year? Wouldn't planting cover crops in the off season help with this issue as well? Uh, I actually answered this in another episode in the series, but because it is a popular question and I'm asked a lot, I'm going to go ahead and answer it here too. So yeah, these tom tomato trellis back here would be very difficult to move. Well, not very difficult, but I don't. I don't move it. I don't, I haven't had the need to move it. And I really believe it's because every season my beds get topped up with about three inches of new compost. I don't turn it in. It's three inches and then mulch on top of that. So there's a good four to five inches burying the pathogens in the soil from previous years. The whole point of crop rotation is so that tomato pests don't just sit in the ground and wait for the next year and then they're already there to attack. Crop rotation is generally a four year period of rotating those tomatoes around in different areas. So on the fourth year, by the time they get back to that first bed, those uh, these diseases and pests have died out or gone away. In my situation, that layer is a physical barrier there between the pathogens and the plants. So even if they're splash up, um, they're not mixing in. Cover crops grown at the same time, not in the off season, but at the same time, cover crops can actually provide a living mulch and, and will help. Stay tuned for an upcoming companion planting video about that. All right, Andy, how come you don't use the rose and flowering formula from Neptune's Harvest? They recommend the tomato and veg during early stages, then the rose formula during later stages of flowering and fruiting. They do, and I've been asked this a lot. And really, the only reason I don't just openly suggest both is budgetary. Is that a, is that a word? Um, if you have the budget to buy both, great. Do it exactly how they say, and yes, that would be a benefit. The, um, the rose and flowering has a higher middle and last number, so the phosphorus and potassium, and that is for fruit and flowers. So, of course, that's going to help. However, I do believe that the tomato and veg formula is a standalone, so if you cannot afford both, you're going to be just fine with the tomato and veg. Erasima Calvillo, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Great video, Brian. Love how big your broccolis are getting. Uh, I've come again and again to learn. I'm glad. Thank you. The broccolis are actually gone. I harvested the second um, secondary, you know, all the side shoots. I got actually a pretty good amount off of there. And then I took them out because I'm going to be planting the squash in that bed. Can you give us some tips to get rid of grasshoppers? That's a that's really a problem for my garden. Or are they good bugs? Uh, they're not necessarily good bugs, and one or two of them aren't necessarily bad bugs. I don't get swarms of grasshoppers here. I'll get one or two that I see here and there, and I don't worry about it because one or two, they don't eat that much, and then they move on. But if you are getting a swarm of them, yeah, they can decimate your garden in a couple of days. So uh, really for grasshoppers, you want to repel them to keep them from even coming into your garden or, or eating your plants. And there's a couple of things that grasshoppers don't like, and that is uh, the pepper spray that we were talking about earlier and uh, garlic. They hate the smell of garlic. So they're not going to want to eat your plants if they've got garlic. So in addition to the pepper spray, Neptune's Harvest also has a garlic spray that you can spray on your plants and the smell for the most part for us people walking through the garden dissipates but stays on the plants strong enough for those bugs to be repelled and it works for other bugs too not just grasshoppers all right our next question is from deborah love your channel big fan thank you deborah um, i have raised beds i filled with bagged soil meant for raised beds still check the ph Anything other than compost and mulch I need to add. Thanks for the great content and your delivery of it. You're welcome. Uh, as far as the pH in bag mixes, I mean, I've never had a problem with a bag mix. Typically they have um, 
they do testing for that and they're not going to be too alkaline or too acidic it wouldn't hurt to just maybe low you know just test it with a tester or with the test strips like i had shown in, in one of my um probably the video you commented on but you're not really going to have usually an issue with that other than compost and mulch compost and mulch are going to build your soil structure and they're going to enhance your microbial life in the soil it gives all of those good bugs and worms stuff to eat so they're healthy and they multiply that's not fertilizer so you're still going to need to fertilize your your beds the thing is though the upside of adding good mulch and compost and having all that microbial action is you can use less fertilizer because the the microbes and the fungus and all of that actually act as shuttles for the nutrients into the plants so the more you have the more you know nutrients they're going to be able to grab and push into the plant so you don't need as much in the soil hope that makes sense Okay, L. Adams, question. On my planting dates worksheet, I'm seeing ones like cabbage that you start four to six weeks before the last frost, but then you plant them four to six or four weeks before the last frost. I'm confused. What do you do when the dates are so close? Would I calculate the first frost if I wanted to plant in the winter? Thanks, I'm learning a lot, but have a ways to go. When you see something like this, it's pretty much because the plants are frost hardy. So you could grow cabbage, cauliflower, uh, broccoli. They're going to have faster germination and get a stronger, faster start if you start them indoors. If it's four to six weeks before your last frost. However, because they're frost tolerant, you can put them out as transplants around the same time. So yeah, that is a bit confusing at first, but that's all it means. It, they, they will start faster for you indoors. Doesn't mean you can't start them outdoors, but putting the transplants in the garden before the frost is gone is okay too, because they will tolerate frost. Okay, Chris White. Mulch, is a layer of compost sufficient? If not, where do you source straw that doesn't have seeds? I heard you should avoid straw from the big garden centers. I've never seen straw at garden centers. Maybe it's just here. Uh, mulch, I, I, compost is definitely sufficient. What I use is actually half finished compost, my homemade compost that's not quite done. That makes a great mulch because it does everything a mulch should do but it's, it's, it's kind of pre almost digested for all the good bacteria, the good bugs, the worms, and they can finish it off and help pull it down into the soil. So that's a great thing to use. Now I get my straw. In fact, I just mulched all of my raised beds with straw um, a few days ago. I get mine from a local feed store and yeah, usually it's going to have seeds because whatever the straw was, there's probably seeds of it in there. The good news is those seeds are actually very easy or the sprouts are actually very easy to pluck out. So I don't worry about that too much. The X-Man 1970 wife wants to know if the parasitic wasps will also kill butterfly eggs on parsley, etc. Will they spread to an entire backyard? She does have milkweed to attract butterflies. Yes, they will. They, they are not discriminate when it comes to caterpillars that they uh, finish off. However, they won't get them all. And really what your goal is, you're, you're, you're trying to increase the biodiversity in your garden. And in nature, the wasps are meant to find butterfly larva, caterpillar, and use that as a nesting ground. That's what kills them. That's what happens in nature. But it doesn't happen to them all. That's why butterflies lay so many eggs, right? So yes, your butterfly population might uh, initially decrease, but if you are following an entire organic program, you're gonna bring more butterflies in to lay more eggs, and it's just gonna create a balance. There's always you know, a give and take, there's the circle of life, and that's what you want to be happening in your garden. So one a better way than to buy parasitic wasps and put them in your garden because yes that 
is not quite a balance that's bringing in, you know, a whole bunch at one time, which isn't natural, right? So they might destroy all of the caterpillars. But what you can do is plant um, plants from the carrot family. So we're talking about carrots, radishes, dill, parsley, cilantro, fennel, and let some of them go to flower. And all of those plants have an um, umbrella looking flower with thousands of little flowers full of pollen. And those are what attract the parasitic wasps naturally to your garden. Again, another sneak preview of our companion planting series. But that's gonna help, you know, really create a good balance of butterflies to wasps in your garden. Okay, that's it for the questions. Now for the winners of the blackberry plants from my garden. All right, so we've got three winners. One was from YouTube. One was from my Instagram account. If you're not following me on Instagram, follow me. And then the third one was from Noah's Instagram account. And I have to thank all of you. He, he actually got more Instagram followers than I did. I'm hoping that's because a lot of you are already following me. <laughs> but anyway, it made him feel really great. So thank you for that. So first, the winner from YouTube is Donnie McWhorter. Hope I pronounced that right, Donnie. Um, oh, how I would love to get some of those blackberries so I can take them to Knott's and show off. Well, obviously you are here in Southern California, <laughs> Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, so yeah, do that. Plant them, take them and show off. From my Instagram account, the winner is Lori Larson. I'm very fond of a lollaberry pie. It's a deliciously sweet blackberry. So you know what a lollaberries are already. Yes, they make a very good pie and they're really great to just eat in the garden. And then from Noah's Instagram account, a rosy life 349. I would love to have some of your heirloom blackberries. Any dish with blackberries is amazing. I agree. Fresh off the vine, dumplings and jam are the best in my book. Dumplings. I need that recipe. So if you are a winner, go to my website, nextlevelgardening.tv. Go to the contact us page and send me an email through that form that says your name and where you want your blackberries sent. And I will get those out uh, very shortly, I've actually, I'm rooting some in the garage on heat mats as we speak, so I could give everybody uh, what I promised. Okay, that's it. So I will see you guys tomorrow, Saturday, 7.30 Pacific time. I will be on there for two hours answering questions live. I think that got a little misconstrued last time when I said that. It's not a live stream, but I will be in the comments. I will be monitoring the comments personally for the first two hours. So if you're commenting or asking questions, I'll be there to answer them. So tomorrow morning, 7.30, our first episode in our Edible Landscape Companion Planting series. See you then.